Okay, welcome everyone to our afternoon at the Equality Lounge with GE Healthcare. My name is Carolyn Detman and I am the CMO of the Female Quotient. What is the Female Quotient? The Female Quotient, well, essentially equality is our business at the Female Quotient and we ensure that essentially we make sure that this stage is ours for women. We are here to ensure equality in, across every single industry and we are thrilled to be here hosted by GE Healthcare today. So gather around everyone and we're gonna have a fabulous conversation. Um, the topic today is when women lead, what they achieve, why they succeed, and how we can learn from them. And we've got an incredible panel um, here with us today that we're gonna talk through. Um, and I'm gonna actually let them introduce themselves because they are really, really accomplished and they're gonna do the best job. So I'm really excited. This lady to my left, to your right, um, she's been doing a lot of the talking today and now she gets to be on the uh, receiving end of the, the question. So, Joy. Hi, my name is Joy Rios and I have actually been working in healthcare for uh, close to 15 years and really got cut my teeth in value-based care when the High Tech Act uh, came about and really learning how the ins and outs of the merit-based incentive payment system. So I had gone, come from educating, training, and actually what I consider kind of doing your health data taxes for a lot of clinicians and supporting, you know, uh, understanding what CMS is looking for. And uh, in 2018, I kind of uh, identified a different problem that we have in healthcare, which was that women are not necessarily heard or have a platform to really be heard. And so that is when I created and founded the Hit Like a Girl podcast. So Health IT, Hit Like a Girl. And I've been doing that for um, nearly five years. We have amplified close to 300 women within the space. And it's been really the honor and pleasure of a lifetime. The, the work is needed and I feel like we've just barely started, so. Incredible, everyone, let's just give a round. And I think also I would say this, if we could just have a second for hit like a girl, health IT. This is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant. I love it and I'm, I'm like obsessed now. Okay, so now over to you, Anka. Tell everyone who you are. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Anka Del Rio. I am based in Switzerland, in, in Zurich actually. My background is health economics and public health. I have been working for health systems um, my whole career passing from health systems performance to health systems innovation and sliding towards um, digital public health in the past six years um, across the globe, but mostly in the dark countries um, in Europe, which you're probably familiar with. So therefore I know GE Healthcare very well as well. Um, very famous doing so many um, inno innovative things actually for healthcare and in healthcare in, in Europe. Um, Right now, I'm actually the president of the EIT alumni um, organization, which is part of the European Commission. We are the largest alumni um, community in the world of innovators and entrepreneurs trained by our various um, communities from health to digital climate, food, and everything that stays at the intersection with health, actually. Very happy to be here. I'm not going to bore you more <laughs> with my journey. I'm waiting for you to shoot other questions later. Not boring later. at all. In fact, it's why you're on this stage. So <laughs> congratulations, everyone. So to you. Okay, Gabriella, I'm not even gonna try. Do you guys hear all this noise? We need to get our voice heard even louder now, right? Especially mm -hmm. women. So this is perfect. It shows us that everything we do, there will be background noise and we don't have to pay attention to that, but keep doing what we're doing best. I'm Gabriella Wilson. Um, I'm an immigrant to healthcare, just I'm an immigrant to this country. So I was born in Romania. I started in as a chemical engineer there and I didn't like it. Um, and after the Romanian revolution, I moved to Belgium. And this is when I was first exposed to molecular biology, biotechnology, and I loved it except for the experimental part. So I decided I'm gonna go into computational field and I moved um, into computer-aided drug design, more like pharmaceuticals, thinking I'm gonna be one day rich and famous, discovering the best blockbuster drug. Uh, that didn't happen, but uh, I'm getting closer to being a little more famous by being here today with all these <laughs> famous ladies and all of you. Um, I, uh, I came to United States to do my PhD in computational uh, biochemistry and knowing that I will move into pharmaceuticals, 
which I did, but the more I was working in that field, I realized that it's not enough to look at having therapeutic drugs to solve a problem, but we need to understand what causes the problem and how can we learn more about each individual to help them live healthier lives. So I moved into health informatics, public health informatics, um, starting from scratch in academia from uh, assistant professorship to now full professor at the University of Texas at Arlington, where I call it with Dr. Marian Ball, who is known a great uh, lady uh, known as the mother of nursing informatics. Um, and we are co-leading uh, the and co-founded the center, multi-interprofessional center for health informatics. Thank you. Shout out to Marion too. Um, I typically ask people to take their name tags off. However, I asked Gabriella to leave it on. If we could just take a look, if we will, at her name tag and all of the different things that she's <laughs> got on it. Um, it's pretty fantastic, um, and I think indicative of just what a powerful woman that we've got today on our panel. Okay, so I want to kick things off first and foremost. Um, when we think about getting more women into healthcare, into technology, into HIT, um, you all found yourselves here. And Gabriel, you started to talk about sort of what, what intrigued you. I'm so curious for, for, Joy, why don't I start with you? What got you into this? And, and what would you tell younger women today about going into this? So I actually, um, when I was going through my MBA program, it had a focus in sustainability. And while I was going through that program, I was working for a utility scale solar company. And it was a startup and, and it was a great experience. But around that, the finish of my degree in 2010-ish, there was the passing of the High Tech Act. And that was something that was an incentive for a lot of clinicians to adopt EHR technology. And my specialty tends to be in training and education. So I basically, well, basically devoured that rule and tried to understand why people should care about this. And so once I got into health IT, even though it wasn't an area that I had anticipated being, once I started learning about it, I was like, I, this is, this is it. I found my place because it has, it is so impactful. And from a sustainability perspective, it, like there's a systemic and systems approach to things that you're affecting environment, populations, you know, and, and people's health. I was just like, this is, this is the place to be to make an impact for sure. Wonderful. Um, Anka, how about you? Well, I was always fascinated about high risk and highly structured environments. So after I graduated my, my studies, I, I knew I was not made for an office per se. So I was really looking for that, um, for the challenge. And I always found fascinated the dynamics of the healthcare systems and the way they actually evolve and then further develop. Therefore, actually, my first steps in my career, I have become an audit for quality of care and patient safety up to the point of the pandemic, where it really made a difference, I would say. It was like um, a peak of everything I have been, been working on and trying to raise my voice in um, patient safety in general, in, in making the use of data for, for better purposes. And um, yeah, I think it was more like, um, a matter of choices that I made early on, but slowly I got guided by the right mentorship and I have been put in the right context where I was inspired to, to join a profession in this field and to do what makes me happy. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Gabriella, to, just to add to what you said earlier, what do you tell to young women or what do you hope for young women to, to make sure that we get them in this field? Well, I think we have enough women in healthcare. If you look at nurses, majority are women. Now, how come that with so many women in healthcare, very few women are leaders, very few women are going into health IT because they feel intimidated by technology. And moving from industry into academia, I realized very early on, especially with the High Tech Act that you mentioned, Joy, that we didn't have the right training. So I made a huge effort to establish training in health informatics, information technology, and a, a huge effort to attract those women and tell them it's not about programming. If you want programming, you go into computer science, although I kind of lied about that because it's good to know programming, but to not make them feel so intimidated by this whole concept of health informatics is informatics only. 
um, I started talking a lot about how technology impacts people's lives and how the way we use it in an appropriate way can have such a huge impact on healthier lives, but also connecting with one another. So when you give those clear examples to young people, and we're talking about women this age, but I'm talking to kids. I was invited in my son's middle school to talk about what I was doing, and I was like, oh boy, what am I going to tell them about health informatics? And I did not use health informatics at all. I actually use that what do you do with technology to have an impact on, on people's lives and how we connect now with one another. So if we try to, um, I don't want to use it in this way, but it's basically dumb it down and make it accessible to every audience. And uh, as researchers and especially academics, we like to put things in a very sophisticated way to make it feel we are important. I never do this because I know I'm going to lose my audience. So I'm always using the simplest possible way to show if you are going into this field, this is what you're going to do. And if you are a woman, we need you because we have all these nurses who might not listen to a male, but they will listen to a woman on a health IT team telling them you need to implement this technology because this is how you, it's going to work, um, help you in your workflow. They will listen to another woman more than they will listen to a man. And this is how we all need to be very sensitive to who we're working with. Um, I mentioned more women are in healthcare in, as nurses. Um, so male are not majority. So when we talk about equality, I don't want of us to only think about we need more women. They are areas where we need more men. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about equality, we don't have to forget that it's not just about us. So I, I'd like to add something and really considering specifically to the technology side and health IT and getting more women involved, you know, we, we say data and technology that feels very robotic, but it is really a representation of a human and a human experience and something that is a representation of what we all go through. And so it needs to have different perspectives built into it. And I feel like specifically coming from a woman, woman's health or we need to have representation because we can't have products and services that are created for us without us being part of it. And I, and I'll, I think that speaks to my point. Yeah, I mean, I learned earlier today for the first time that the inventor of the pap smear was a man. <laughs> um, and that is that, that it was somewhat problematic, right? right so, at the cons time. yeah, just considering the devices used within a pap smear itself. Like, I'm sure if a, a, a woman was part of the contra you know, the design of that piece of equipment, um, it might be slightly different and perhaps more comfortable for well, women. Absolutely. What yeah. are some of the other the other challenges slash barriers that you're seeing, particularly from a leadership perspective? Because you're right. We have a lot of women in healthcare, but we don't have a lot of women leaders. So what do you think the big barriers still are that we have to address? I think that there's a ton of barriers that we have to address. And one of them, it's, a, it's uncomfortable and difficult conversations of bringing people to the table who uh, the decisions that we make affect them. I mean, unfortunately, we're, I've been in healthcare for, you know, 15 years, and I can't say with confidence that we have better out, outcomes for patients given the amount of technology that we've brought, you know, to, 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 to play within that time frame. And unfortunately, we're, it's kind of going, it's a little bit, it's going backwards, I have to say. And so we have a problem. And I think that it's an issue that, of trust when we have to be thinking about, okay, whoever is participating in the healthcare system, how can they be confident that the data and technology is not going to be used against them? And, you know, well, that, that's somewhat controversial, but I believe it to be accurate yeah. and true. Fair. Uh, yeah. Okay, anything to add? I would say that we need to start breaking the silos in healthcare, not just talking about it, because we're talking about it and in policy making and in health policy for a while. But um, the conversation has not been fully opened also with the industry on one extent. And um, I think this is critical because we see startups on one hand making a huge change in healthcare. We see more um, female entrepreneurs and we're so proud of it. Um, the question lays, 
do they talk with the policymakers? Do policymakers listen to them? Because in the end, the product it's going to affect or um, influence the whole system as a whole. So I think the big challenge in breaking the silos is actually having all stakeholders sit at the same table from policy level to um, the industries, to the big tech companies, which are bringing so much to, to, to the healthcare industry in the end, and up to the startups, universities, and hospitals. At this moment, unfortunately, not only in the US, but in Europe as well, they don't speak the same language. They don't understand each other yet. So I think that's going to be probably the, the first step towards having a real progress in, in changing the paradigm and, and having a shift happening. Right, absolutely. I mean, I think, look, uh, uh, the World Economic Forum has said it's going to take 132 more years to close the gender gap. Yet, this industry, right, in the last year, in one year's time, created life-saving vaccines, right? Chad GPT was created in two weeks, two weeks, and yet we're saying gender gap is going to take another 132 years. So in, with that as sort of the backdrop, and I'm going to ask you, Gabriella, what do you... Like, where do you think healthcare is in all of this? Do you think, when, when you think about this, how important is it that we get this right in relation to other industries? Uh, well, <laughs> there is, technology is advancing really quickly and in other industries very fast and healthcare has always been behind. Um, and it's because it's a complicated business industry, right? There are so many regulations. Now we're talking about AI, machine learning, and how is this going to be regulated? And from the ethics perspective, is are we going to make? Are you are you sure that are we sure if we use AI tools, we are including everybody? Because we saw with clinical trials, I worked in pharmaceutical industries, and we were in industry, and we are trying uh, doing clinical trials in India, for example, on male. And then you have the drug approved, you come to the United States and hey, all of, a, all of a sudden, it doesn't work for us, for us, women, for us. So it's the same, uh, uh, the same way I look at AI and all these tools being developed that are extremely powerful. But if you don't have the right data that represents everybody, this is going to be a problem for all of us. Um, so healthcare is catching up. Just by being here today in this forum and seeing all these new companies uh, coming out after this pandemic, we all stayed home, but we are very productive. So what you see today, it's much more than we saw a few years ago. Um, and you see more women. To me, it's very encouraging. What I think in healthcare needs to happen is to identify those great mentors, uh, pioneers, people who know how to understand the patient's need before we start pushing technology out there and telling clinicians you have to use this, we need to understand that we are in this business because of the people we serve. And I think this is something that we forget. And I'm, uh, in my research, I, I look at health inequities, uh, especially in the Latino populations and African-Americans. And I know these things exist everywhere in the world. And if we have women taking the leadership on these um, important initiatives. I think we have an advantage as women because we have a high content of empathy. So even with technology, that's why you need to include more women in tech companies because we put our heart before we put our brain in everything we do, including love, by the way, but the way we love someone. Uh, so. That is a plus, people. I mean, you can suffer from it, but it's most of the time a plus. And we don't forget that. If we are in healthcare, we are here to serve the people, to improve healthcare outcomes. And yeah, make money in the US because we are a business, but you know, that's part of the game. We are in, in higher education, we do exactly the same way, but our student is at the center of everything we do. So if we are keeping that in mind, that we are where we are because of the people we serve, I think we can make progress and push, push for regulations, push for policy changes because of that and have real patience with us when we go and talk about initiatives. Not 
smart women here getting an award and talking. Uh -huh. I want to be a, someone that experienced something in healthcare and I can share that with you and just say, because of that, I am where I am today. It's incredible. And I want to thank Gabriella. She's actually in such demand, high demand, that she's going to leave us oh um, to go um, elsewhere. So thank you, Gabrielle. We're going to continue so much. this conversation. I appreciate it. You in good um, hands. Anka, um, what about you? When you think about like what are the critical things that, that you want to see this industry doing, what would you say? I'm leaning more towards investment, to be honest. Um, as I have been working a lot with male, white male leadership in healthcare and in healthcare provision, I think that's already biased and it's so, so embedded in the system that it's going to take the long while you were actually mentioning before. However, I think we have um, much faster chances to actually do something in health tech investment. We're seeing now that more and more doctors, medical doctors, are switching towards health tech investment. Um, I've heard some criticism about it. I think it's, um, it's a great thing, to be honest. I think that um, Despite of the stuff shortages in healthcare, we have AI, we have so many tools, and we have ways to tackle that if we just look in the right direction. However, in health tech investment, if we are being careful and if we are being aware early on, which is now, we can still do so much change by investing in the right companies. If there are more health tech investors, female health tech investors, I think that things will go also in the right way. and will guide the new companies towards having a meaningful and a powerful impact towards the future of healthcare and of health tech. I love that. Um, now, we do have some men in the audience. I'd like to A, point that out and say thank you um, for joining. Um, but I also want to ask, and Joy, I'll ask you this question. You know, for the men out there, what, what can they be doing, right, to really show their support? What, what, what do you think? I think more than just words, actions. Um, ultimately that follow those. I mean, we, you, you asked earlier about technology and I considered the dangers. Like if we already have systems that are not working and we have this amazing technology that allows us to make these systems work faster and do more, are we not just then duplicating systems that aren't working for so many people already? And so I think that if they have an opportunity to develop leaders, to invite them to the table, to practice active listening as much as possible with under, with not just women, but vulnerable and underrepresented, you know, communities, do that often. Not, not, it's not a one and done thing. Do it all the time, as much as possible. Love it. Anka, what do you think? Oh, I can actually circle back to that and I would say if you're a woman and you're invited to speak up and you're invited to a panel, do not decline, do not recommend a male colleague to replace you. It has happened so many times when I have been um, organizing anything and, and then, um, yeah, funny enough, uh, females are just rejecting invitations. Um, be confident. Grow your confidence, surround yourself with the right people to grow that confidence further, not only with women, uh, with women and female leaders, but also with male leaders that are able and willing to support you and, um, and speak up whenever you have the chance. Absolutely, and I think we gotta normalize things. You know, it's funny, we were walking up here today, hymns, we hear about hymns, 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 and we were like, wait a minute, where's her uh -huh. in all of this? And so <laughs> we're calling this hymns for her and where and her stands, her stands for um, health, equity, representation, sustainability, and the other S. Anybody want to add another S? Anybody? Society. So, society. I go. love it. Okay, I love it. All right. Well, so with a minute left, I just want to see if anybody out in the audience has a question for our panel. Anybody? Okay. Ross Martin, I'm the CMAO of Jillian, a consulting firm. Um, I'm so glad, Joy, that you brought up at the end the other disparate populations, because one of the questions I have about the series that you've been doing today, it's the first time I've heard it today, of talking beyond uh, women's issues and the, the diverse populations of underrepresented minorities, and, you know, this is still a very white-looking community uh, and still a very male-dominated community. And we see other things about LGBTQ plus uh, populations. What um, what do you think the role of women in that should be in raising 
the, the status of women in the industry, but also beyond? I would say intersectionality is key. Inclusivity is key. A sense of belonging is key. It's not just a matter of having somebody standing next to you for a photo opportunity, but really making sure that those populations feel front and center, included, and that they belong. And we have a lot of work to do on that, I'll be, I'll be honest. And, you know, I think it takes all of us sort of bringing that up and saying it, and whether it's to organizers of events of saying we want to see more of that, I think that we have a responsibility to be advocates. If we have the privilege, I am a white presenting Latin American woman, and I know that I have privilege, even from like a, that sense of being a minority, and I try to do my best to advocate as much as possible. Yeah, I, I, I would add to that. We believe inherently in the power of the pack. Um, a person alone, right, has power, but together we have impact. And the reality is that the collective minority is bigger than the majority, right? So, so we've really got to be coming at this together um, for us to really make an impact. Anka, final word? Um, maybe adding up on that, saying we are all talking about adapting to a new normal after the pandemic. I think what we should be thinking of is more like adapting to all this changing, like it's the new normal as well. So stop acting like it's such a new thing that we need to give or put it in a special place. I think that if we would start acting more normal about integrating everybody and acting like it has been like that forever, not neglecting the changes that have happened, but really seeing as it is the way it is, I think it's it's actually the, the way forward. I like that, the way forward. Anga and Joy, thank you so much and thank you for being a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. This has been great.